So good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining our HEFS webinar on enhancing foods for healthy benefits fruitification. The subject of food fruitification has already been researched and implemented for many years. The World Health Organization and the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization consider that one of the strategies to improve food intake of nutrients is through food fruitification, which allows us providing nutrients to a large segment of the population without the need for radical change in food consumption patterns. So today we have a panel of experts in food fruitification who will explain what food fruitification is, the regulations and some examples applied in each food uh, sectors. So before presenting the first speaker, this um, webinar will be recorded and it will be available on HEFS project websites. Also during the webinar, please use the Q&A box to submit questions to speakers. Uh, we will have uh, 10 minutes for questions in final of the webinar. The first speaker is Daniel Haveris, who is uh, in Science Area Manager at Kuzaga, and he will present the HAFS projects uh, in which this webinar is inserted. So Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Susanna. Welcome, everybody. Um, so I'm going to introduce you the project AFIS. which is a quadruple helix Atlantic area, healthy food ecosystem for growth of SMEs. So projects supporting, uh, providing uh, innovation support services and training for healthy food SMEs. So what is AFIS? This is an European project funded by the Interreg Atlantic area, uh, which has been put in place between uh, March 2019 and goes until August, 2022. Sorry, so, Daniel. Uh, can you you don't have again? you don't have the presentation in um okay just okay. wait a <laughs> second okay something went wrong can you see it now yes um uh, i don't it's not not in the in the model of presentation yet okay. it's okay now all right Okay, thank you, Susanna. Okay, so uh, give me a second. Okay, okay, so uh, all right, so I was just saying uh, what was office, and I just wanted to go directly to the context. So, the food sector is a priority um, in the regions uh, which are involved in this project. Strategically, uh, it has a strategic, strategic and economic relevance. Although there are global uh, challenges um, in healthier food and lifestyles due to mainly um, the increasing rates of overweight and obesity, which are linked together to the uh, non communicable diseases. Furthermore, um, healthy food and nutrition were already a topic. Uh, among the public health policies in Europe. So developing new improved or improved healthy food products uh, um, calls for, for innovation and more innovation capacity. That's why we have a common challenge, which is the accelerate, uh, accelerating of the growth in key healthy food uh, and lifestyle sectors of the Atlantic area by means of the stimulation of cooperation, innovation, and uh, the joint development of solutions. So what is the goal? The final goal is to improve the overall competitiveness and growth of SMEs in the value chain of a healthy food and lifestyles uh, by contributing to enhancing the transnational innovation ecosystem, which helps the SMEs to access knowledge, um, collaborators, markets, uh, and align the products um, uh, with um, the consumer trends and needs and expectations. For well, this office provides several support services for SMEs, such as the ones you see here. Um, the first one is uh, innovation intelligence. This is done by means of consumer and market trends reports, and also research and development uh, trends reports. The second service is um, the SEEK for alliances and projects for innovation. For instance, the support to the establishment uh, of innovation alliances, devalized uh, support for, uh, to innovation plans 
or the identification of research and development funding calls. The third one is business growth. What is this? So um, this, the project provides uh, design and marketing support strategies, introduction to commercial partners and stakeholders, and also the support in the development of business plans. Finally, the, the fourth uh, service is internationalization by means of the development of internationalization strategies and international market intelligence. Each of these services is provided by the contact points in each country. There are also several training programs. The first one is consumer insights uh, and market understanding. Second one is uh, product life cycle management. Third one is market development. And the fourth one is product development uh, and the critical path management. These are the members of the ACES um, project partnership, uh, Cluster Alimentario de Galicia here in Spain, Food and Drink in Northern Ireland, Valoreal in France, ET Food um, based in Spain, um, Big Innovation, and in UK, um, University of Galway in Ireland, Eden of Cluster, and in Portugal, Instituto Nacional de Saúde, Ricardo Giorgi, also in Portugal, and finally, Food and Drink Wales in Wales. So please, if you have any questions regarding the project, don't hesitate to contact us um, throughout this um, email, or please visit uh, the website or the social media for more information. I hope this was um, interesting, and please let us know if you have any comments or doubts. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for the presentation of the HAPS project. So the next um, speaker is Dr. Charlotte Philip, is the Food INOV Group's Nutrition, Regulatory and Scientific Advisor Manager. Today, she was going to, to talk about certification from a nutritional and regulatory point of view. So Charlotte, the floor is yours. So let me share my screen here. So uh, hello everyone, I'm uh, Charlotte Philippa. I'm the Nutrition uh, Regulatory and Scientific Affairs Manager um, at Foodinov. Uh, so who is Foodinov Group? It's a French uh, independent and private company dedicated to food innovation, uh, R&D and nutrition. Uh, so we have three um, main activities at Foodinov. First one is Foodinov Nutrition. Uh, so what we do at Foodinov Nutrition, we do uh, scientific and regulatory uh, consultancy. We do uh, nutrition uh, R&D. We have a, a laboratory, R&D laboratory, and we do um, we uh, help our clients with uh, the uh, manufacturing uh, industries and finding uh, manufacturers. So uh, our mission is really uh, to support our clients in launching ingredients or uh, final products uh, in the food supplements, nutrition and health sector. So we are really dedicated to a nutrition product. The other activity is Export Alim. Uh, so at Export Alim, we are doing uh, regulatory assistance to export product outside of Europe. So mainly uh, USA, Canada, uh, Asia, or uh, Brazil. Um, and we are helping with the regulatory aspects or uh, also assistance in the custom procedures, um, such as prior notice uh, in the USA. And uh, third activity, it's Food Enough Development. Uh, so what do we do at Food Enough Development? We are doing creativity workshop but also R&D because we also have a, a laboratory over there and we are helping our, our clients to develop um, significant innovations um, to put on the market. So today um, I'm going to speak about uh, food fortification uh, in terms of regulatory and, uh, and nutrition. So first of all, what are we talking about? What is food fortification? So it's about adding nutrients to process food or uh, replace the nutrients that were lost during the process. So you have to know that uh, fortification is not allowed in unprocessed foods such as 
um, uh, vegetables, fruits, uh, meat, poultry, or fish, uh, which are not processed. Um, also, you know that uh, fortification is a tool that has been, been used by the food industry since many, many, many years now. Uh, and why are we doing food fortification? First of all, to improve the nutritional status of uh, some populations and uh, to fight against micronutrient deficiencies. So the most common uh, deficiencies we, we have in Europe are uh, vitamins A and D, some of the group B vitamins, iodine, and uh, iron. So why, why fortifying food? Um, even if we know that uh, overnutrition, uh, meaning excess of fat, excess of calories, sugar, uh, has taken over uh, from undernutrition, um, uh, which is not the, the main concern in, in Europe for sure, uh, fortification can still appeal to some consumers, uh, those who are looking for uh, more than basic, basic nutrition or those who are at risk of deficiencies. So it can concern many, many different populations from babies and small children, uh, teenagers or sports person who have higher nutritional needs, uh, senior people for sure, pregnant women uh, or people recovering uh, from illness or surgery. So uh, the populations that can be um, interested in fortification are, are, are very different. Uh, elderly people, so they are at risk of deficiency, so there is a very strong market opportunity uh, knowing that the population is, uh, is aging. Uh, there's also an opportunity with the rising popularity of plant-based diet because um, people who are vegan or vegetarian uh, can be at risk um, of lacking some nutrients such as uh, vitamin B12, calcium uh, or iron. Um, a few examples of fortification policies we have in, in Europe. Um, so by that, I mean uh, any mandatory fortification uh, and uh, how is it working? Um, it's working when you put that in place on products that are uh, consumed regularly and in large amounts. So you usually see some, some fortification policies on cereals, on, the, on condiments or on milk. And it is the case in Europe. So we have that on salt uh, with iodine. Um, it's been mandatory in about uh, 120 countries, uh, including many, many EU countries. Uh, you have to know also that every country uh, decides the, the level of fortification according to the specific needs of the population. Uh, in France, for example, it's not mandatory, it remains voluntary, um, especially because French people are uh, large consumers of uh, dairy products, which is um, a contributor in iodine uh, intake. So French people don't need as much iodine as uh, other populations in other uh, EU countries. Uh, wheat flour fortification with B vitamins is quite common as well. There's a, a food fortification in initiative uh, existing for grains. Uh, usually it's only on a voluntary basis, except in the UK where there has been um, a fortification policy since many, many years for vitamins B1, B2, calcium and iron. And very recently they have been discussing the, the possibility to add um, acid folic to that fortification as well. And milk, for, milk fortification with vitamin, vitamin D uh, which is mandatory in Finland and Sweden since the 90s and voluntary in France. So about regulatory aspects now. Um, so uh, in, in 2006, WHO and the United Nations uh, published the guidelines, uh, published some guidelines for food fortification in macro, micronutrients. Uh, in, Europe, in Europe, we also had a, um, a regulation coming in 2006 and which is applicable since 2007. So it's regulation uh, number 1925 on the addition of vitamins, minerals, and uh, other uh, substances to food. So uh, um, other substances, according to the regulation, it's any other substance than a vitamin or, min uh, or mineral uh, that has a nutritional or physiological effect. So the scope of the regulation is every food product, uh, including food product for particular nutritional uses, if there are no uh, specific provisions uh, for those foods, 
and it's any product with or without a nutrition claim. So what are the objectives of the fortification? Uh, first one is fortification for sure. And you can see on the, the product uh, on the right here, uh, Petit Filou is a good example of, of a basic fortification with the addition of calcium and vitamin D. Um, the second objective of fortification can be the restoration of uh, nutrients uh, that were lost during the process. And uh, here, the example is a fruit juice, um, which can have lost uh, vitamins during the process. So it is possible to fortify to uh, come back to the initial level of vitamins. And uh, third reason um, for uh, fortification is the nutrition equivalence. And here an example is any um, plant-based uh, milk in which you don't have uh, calcium occurring naturally. So you can uh, fortify your product to um, uh, get the equivalence with a regular uh, milk. So uh, still in terms of um, uh, regulatory aspects, uh, uh, it's important to know that fortification must be justified in terms of uh, its nutritional relevance for the target population. So you can't um, fortify a product uh, in a nutrient which is not interesting for a specific population. Then you have to choose the good nutrient and the right form um, of the nutrient, so probably the most bioavailable substance. And then you have to choose the right uh, food matrix. So it's very important to make sure you are complying with those three um, items when you, you choose to fortify your product. Um, there is no pre-market authorization required, but uh, any manufacturer should keep a file available in case the, uh, it is asked by the supervisory authorities. Um, and this, this file should uh, justify all the three items uh, mentioned uh, above. Also, some EU countries may require a notification, so make sure uh, you are not concerned. Which uh, vitamins and minerals can be used? For that, you can refer to the regulation. There is an existing positive list of vitamins and minerals. You can, you can find it in uh, Annex 1 of the, the regulation, and you can see, uh, you can see it on the right. Um, so this is in terms of which vitamins and which minerals. Then in terms of uh, uh, what form and what sources, you can also refer to the regulation in Annex 2 to know which one uh, are allowed. Then uh, the question is how to determine the appropriate levels of fortifications. Um, you have to take into consideration the two aspects, the minimum and the maximum. So first of all, the minimum, uh, it is linked to the notion of significant amounts, um, which is according to the regulation, 15% of the reference intake. Um, so it is very important to take that into consideration. So you have to evaluate the usefulness of your fortification and make sure you are putting enough uh, of the nutrient to provide a beneficial effect or uh, to fill in a nutrient deficiency. So this is how you determine the, the minimum amount you put in your product. On the other side, about the maximum, you should know that there is no maximum level um, existing in the regulation. Uh, so you have to make sure that there is no more uh, in the product that is safe to be consumed as part of a normal diet. Um, so it is about evaluating the harmlessness of your product uh, and how to do that. Uh, you must estimate the total index uh, from the fortified product uh, plus uh, the intakes uh, from other dietary sources. And then you compare it to uh, the tolerable upper intake. Uh, or if there is no tolerable upper intake to the reference intake for the population. So it is really your responsibility to, to make sure the product is efficient and is uh, safe for the consumers. So we've been talking about uh, vitamins and minerals, now about other substances. So any substance can, uh, which can have a nutritional or physiologi physiological effect can be added to the product. And there are many different forms. Uh, so substances such as taurine, amino acids, essential fatty acids, fibers can be added, 
also substances from ingredients, um, any plants or herbal extract, uh, or uh, an extract which is rich in polyphenol, or um, glucosamine chondroitin from uh, shark cartilage. So here are a few examples, but there are many others. And the third possibility is to add uh, active uh, ingredients such as probiotics or others. So it's uh, the manufacturer responsibility to, to make sure its product uh, is safe. So uh, you, I told you, you had to, to make sure it was safe in terms of uh, dosage, but you also have to make sure it's, sa it's safe in terms of uh, substances added to the product. Um, the regulation deals with other substances, but not in terms of positive list. You only have a negative list of uh, substances forbidden. And there are currently only six uh, prohibited substances on the list and one which is restricted, uh, which is trans fat. In terms of labeling of fortified product, uh, you have to, to put it on the nutrition labeling. It's, uh, it's required, even if it's a nutrient which is voluntary uh, on the nutrition labeling. If you fortify your, your product, it has to be on the label. You have to put the content and the percentage reference intake. In terms of claims, uh, there are some claims allowed. So uh, claims related to the addition of vitamins and minerals are allowed. You can say with this mineral, restored with added vitamin X, or enriched, and for that, you have to uh, respect the same condition set for the claim source of. For the claim increased uh, in any nutrient, um, again, you have to respect the condition set for the claim source of, and you have to make sure that the increase uh, is at least 30% compared to a, a similar product. Uh, fortification and naturality. Um, you know that uh, consumer demand for Clean Label is, uh, is uh, more and more important and it's threatening the acceptance of vitamin and mineral fortification. Also, fortification is forbidden in organic products, except uh, some products such as uh, infant formulas. So for a more Clean Label fortification, uh, it's possible. You, you can do so by using ingredients uh, such as um, uh, superfoods, which are naturally source of some nutrients. And in this case, there is no need to justify the fortification. Uh, so vitamin and mineral ingredients um, uh, that are uh, linked to plant-based sources that are more popular today uh, for consumers. Here on the right, you can find an example of a product uh, which contains acerola, which is a natural source of vitamin C. Bioavailability is also essential. So uh, when you fortify, it's not just about the quantity of the vitamin or mineral, uh, it's also about how the body can use the vitamin um, and, uh, and uh, absorb it. So quantity, but also quality, and it's becoming uh, more and more popular for uh, producers or uh, manufacturers to, to market it on the product, to talk about the bioavailability of the nutrients. Um, here on the product, you can see it's a burger and it's saying that there's a vit vitamin C, which helps uh, the absorption of uh, iron. A few trends uh, in fortification. Uh, so th those data are extracted from Mintel and it shows that dairy and breakfast cereals are the top categories for vitamin and mineral uh, fortification before baby food, uh, juices, bakery, and other products. Uh, we can see sports products are uh, here. And in terms of uh, nutrients and uh, that are the most popular, uh, calcium is the first one, vitamin C and iron uh, are the top three uh, nutrients for, um, for fortification. Okay, so I've finished with the regulatory and nutrition uh, perspective. If you have any question, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte, for the excellent uh, presentation. And uh, you talk about one aspect that uh, is important, that bioavailability of the nutrients, because uh, the nutrient can, the, the food, the 
can have the, the nutrient but lost and they can be the lost bioavailability. So it's important to, um, also the, the, the regulation uh, to know what to, what we need to 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 do to 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 put the the the, the food in the market. So the sure. next <laughs> the next um, speaker is Dr. Narcisa Bandara. Is uh, she is head of the Aquaculture, Epigrating and Bioprospecting Division from the Portuguese Institute for the Sea and Atmosphere. She has 30 years of scientific work in hypergrading fishery and aquaculture products. She will present today the fish fortification, human nutrition improvement. So, Dr. Nar so, thank you for this opportunity to to be with you in this uh, in this webinar with a very important uh, topic. The topic of uh, my presentation is fish fortification, is because uh, we are working in the Institute of Sea and Atmosphere, and of course in the Division of Aquaculture, Upgrading and Bioprospecting, and this is a very synergistic mix to trying to improve and uh, uh, study uh, research projects in terms of fish fortification. And this is what uh, uh, I will share with you in this presentation. Uh, of course, it is very important, as uh, was shown by the, uh, by the, the other pre uh, presenter before me. And uh, of course, this is a topic that needs to be developed. And these are some examples of things that uh, we can uh, also listen because uh, fish is uh, uh, shown as a, a very um, uh, uh, nutritive uh, uh, part of our diet. And it can be um, a, a target vehicle with different uh, um, uh, compounds that we need to increase in our diet. Uh, in fact, uh, I will uh, share with you some uh, projects and some work that was done in, in our division and uh, with the different uh, uh, target compounds that uh, are very important, as was shown before, as iodine, as selenium, and also trying to, to see the direction for future need in research, of course, many things need to be done and the study in this aspect. Why is it important to fortificate fish? This can be, I was telling, a vehicle to give us some nutrients that are scarce in our food and in our uh, diet. And of course, this can be also something that we can add in the feeds when uh, when uh, are developing aquaculture and at the same time give health to the fish because all these nutrients are very important for fish health and at the same time uh, when they are placed in our meal they have increasing of these uh, compounds i will show with you uh, some uh, of them. For instance, I will uh, uh, talk about uh, omega-3 fatty acids, particularly EPA, DHA, and we'll show you iodine selenium. Some other compounds are used in fortification, for instance, also taurine and, uh, and so on. But uh, uh, trying to give you an idea, I will show you what we have done in our uh, project, of course, our uh, source of these uh, uh, compounds are uh, natural sources, as we can see here, for instance, some seaweeds that are very rich in iodine and uh, other microalgae that are very rich in omega-3 fatty acids and can be increased in the, in the diets and other marine organisms that, uh, as we have in our division, the aerobioprospecting is something that we study different compounds that can be extracted from the marine organism, but can be used in the feeds and increase the health of the fish. And at the same time, have at the end in our uh, meal a uh, uh, complete uh, source. For, is, for instance, uh, I will show with you um, a work that we have done in, in, uh, in uh, 
uh, aspects that is a complete line that comes from the the diet uh, and instance for that comes from the 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 development of the feed and then what is uh, in terms of bioaccessibility when you are talking about uh, these farmed fish and what we uh, and uh, of course focusing the omega three omega three fatty acids and particularly trying to find what happened about this ratio because we know <clears throat> that the amount of EPA and DHA sometimes is uh, um, adequate in feeds, but the ratio omega-3, omega-6 need to be evaluated. Because as we know, as fish has become much more vegan, with vegan diets, we are increasing the amount of omega-6 fatty acids. And this balance is all the time uh, important because when we compare with wild, wild ones, they have a very high ratio, N3, N6. And of course, is uh, what we are trying to find. And uh, at the same time, what uh, was the species that we select at this case was uh, sole, um, Senegalian sole and the flat fish with a high commercial level. And we are studying what happened if, if we replace all the fish oil by vegetable oil and trying to go what it happens. No problems relate with the gross performance. But um, what we have done at the end was also, also to evaluate what happened in terms of bioaccessibility of these nutrients. As was shown before, we, we have uh, um, a model that is an in vitro model that simulate what happened before, during our the human digestion. And uh, after we will focus what happened in terms of this bioaccessible uh, fraction, because we know that uh, not an under percent is, uh, um, if uh, I used to say, if the world was perfect, an under percent of all the nutrients will be absorbed but is not, and we need to evaluate what happened to each one. And uh, is uh, uh, the objective of this work. Well, uh, there, more specifically, was the, the fatty acid profile, the lipid bioaccessibility, and the evaluate effect of different dietary oils, and uh, at the end, uh, trying to find what it happens. I will show you some data concerning this uh, and trying to show, for instance, I will, I will uh, share with you that we use three diets. One was based on fish oil and the others more on the um, uh, vegetable oil, like soybean oil, rapeseed oil, linseed oil. And these are what we know that comes from the um, another percent of uh, trying the, that the fish will be vegan and the trying in terms of oil, of course. And uh, this was what happened. Fish oil have a, have a very different, fish diets have a very different profile, of course, we know, because if we are not giving the fish oil, of course, it happened that uh, at the end, DHA will decrease drastically in the case of uh, the vegetable uh, diet. And these are the data that we collect. And of course, the ratio omega-3, omega-6 decreased drastically also in the diets because we are changing that. The fatty acid profile of the muscle mirrors, of course, the diet. And this is something that we can take into account. When we uh, select these, uh, these diets, we know more or less what, what will happen in terms of aquaculture of the, the fish. But it depends from species to species because, as we know, you have a very broad amount of different species. And of course, it, uh, it will uh, change. But pay attention for that. The DHA also drastically decreases. And in terms of omega-3, omega-6, we also have a very, very high decrease. In this, that is only with, um, we know, without fish oil. 
And what happened in terms of bioaccessibility? Uh, uh, pay attention that this data is what happens after uh, place the fish in this model, as after the digestion of the fish and what is, abs uh, what is uh, available to be absorbed in terms of uh, fatty acids. What we see here is linoleic and omega-6 bioaccessibility bio bio is higher as was expecting in that vegan fish. In this vegan fish, uh, it was higher. And the HA bioaccessibility show a different trend. Not as we are expecting that with the increase, it will increase, but the, the median value uh, show as a higher level. And uh, is what we say that is no trend and some studies need also to be developed to study better all these aspects and why these doses didn't give the, the, the clear uh, amount of uh, that. We, when we compare with vegan uh, uh, fish, we know that the vegan fish has a very uh, disadvantaged omega-6 omega ratio. And um, well, these are our main conclusions from this, uh, this uh, work. Dietaral sources has a strong effect on fatty acids of soul muscle. Fatty acids bioaccessibility is not high in soul less than 74%, but in some species we have less than that. And bioaccessibility of fish fatty acids vary between soul-fed different diets. For achieving recommended doses of EPA and DHA 50, that is the medium soul, may be the best to accept in terms of composition. The same I will share all with you, another important species that was studied and in terms of fortification of iodine-rich seaweed. But then with, uh, as I was telling you, Laminaria digitata, that is a, a, a seaweed very rich in iodine. And this can have good uh, results. I have to tell that trout fortification results in a six-fold increase for iodine and 2.9-fold increase for selenium contents without uh, altering sensory uh, aspects, and this is something. The 45 fish present a nutritional uh, contribution for 12.5 for the, the recommended intake for iodine and 78% for selenium. And this is also a good vehicle when we think in the population and we are thinking that this is something that needs to be increased to, to have a population with a higher uh, Health with health recognized health benefits. Um, research is uh, these are some challenges that I'm here to share with you. Research has to be direct into achieving solutions, simultaneous viable for environmental, economic, sustainable. That is something that needs also to be uh, evaluated and trying to this aspect mix. Uh, a, a cocktail of these uh, points and trying to go in this direction. Of course, sensory properties need to be very well evaluated. Bioaccessibility studies must be, must be carried out. And of course, as was referred, not only what is in, inside the fish or in the food, but what is ready to be absorbed by the consumers. And the risk-benefit assessment is also of the areas that we are developing and trying to evaluate all the aspects of this fortification. And at the same time, the stability studies of fortified fish should be performed because areas to um, trying to increase and extend the shelf life of these, all these products is something that is needed and also the studies. These are papers published by our team here in IPMA. These are the names of many people that is involved in this area of research. And of course, to finish, I have a sentence that I think that is important. It means that it's not from today. I was thinking that it was um, uh, François de Rochefort. He was born in 15 September of 1613. 
and uh, as a very, very uh, good sentence that is nowadays something that we need to take into attention. To eat is a necessity, but to eat intelligently is an art. And uh, I give you this uh, sentence to think, and uh, this is my email. And of course, if you have questions, I'm here to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Narcid. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, for the, the excellent presentation about food, uh, fish fortification, because uh, is uh, fish is, uh, I think that one of the metrics um, that is difficult to to fortification, and uh, we have also the the question about the bioaccessibility and the the importance of the the fortification the iodine and the selenium. Um, so because the selenium is important and fish uh, also because the mercury and uh, is an excellent product thank you so the next uh, speaker is dr hives leloir is a research scientist working in national institute of agronomic research and today he will talk about the health benefits of ferment and dye products for target population so the floor okay. is yours. You? Thank you for the introduction. So thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to present the project. In fact, I will not tell you about results because the project was launched uh, a year ago and uh, it illustrates what we can do with uh, uh, dairy products in terms of uh, food fortification. So the project is Prolific Project, which stands for Innovative Fermented Dairy Products and Ingredients for Targeted Populations. Uh, yes. So the, 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 the context is, uh, is uh, the, the Western France, in, in fact, we, we produce and transform a lot of milk in the West of France, in Bretagne. Uh, Bretagne is uh, here and uh, Pays de la Loire is here. So uh, we have um, a complete uh, uh, ecosystem with industry, agro-industry, research, and education all around this uh, dairy sector. So uh, in France, dairy sector is a very competitive sector, and we have a strong academic-private partnership culture. And we all share the same desire to make the best use of this wide gold. So we already constructed or co-constructed some ambitious pre-competitive research projects. And the one I will tell you about today is a prolific project. So the context is that we, 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 we would be particularly interested in fermentation of the milk and milk ingredients. Food fermentations like uh, lactic acid fermentation, propionic acid fermentation, are one of the oldest way to preserve perishable foods like milk, exactly. So the question we will address in this project is, can fermented dairy product have a positive effect on digestive function and on the gut-brain axis? So the idea is to mix milk and bacteria, selected bacteria, to have a huge variety of different fermented milk products or milk ingredients and see the effect on human health. So in addition to the production of organic acids and stuff like that, the activity of bacteria during the lactic acid or propionic acid fermentation, of course, drastically transformed the raw, mater the raw material to give a, a huge variety of different milk products. But also it generates some compounds of interest whose action and benefits can go far beyond a mere preservation. So the, the, the key word we will address we will use in this project are nutrient intake, in, intake yes, uh, organoleptic qualities, biopreservation, but also immunomodulation, food microbiota health interactions, milk microbiota inflammation and cognition. So the context in, a, in, a, in public health is that we live in a world with in, an increasing incidence of chronic digestive and neurological uh, pathologies like neurodegenerative pathologies or neurodevelopmental pathologies. This is for the brain. And for the gut, we have an increasing incidence of inflammatory pathologies like uh, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. 
functional digestive disorders, and also uh, an increasing incidence of food allergy. And all this is uh, accentuated by chronic stress, which is a risk factor for these chronic diseases. So the, the, the philosophy of uh, Prolific, as uh, it was mentioned with uh, De La Roche-Foucault uh, in the previous presentation, here we, we base our hypothesis on a, a sentence by, which is attributed to Hippocrates, may your diet be your first medicine. So we believe that when we ingest a fermented dairy product, we also ingest some lactic acid bacteria, propionic acid bacteria, and all the metabolites that produced during the fermentation. This, this is for uh, short chain fatty acid, conjugated linoleic acid, oligosaccharides, vitamins, etc. So by doing so, oh, maybe I can have the animation, yes. By doing so, all this stuff will interact with the gut microbiota and the, 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 the intestinal epithelial barrier. They, they will interact with this and doing so, they will also interact with the immune system and the enteric nervous system. So you probably know that gut is our second brain and the second brain dialogues with the central nervous system. So we have a gut brain axis. So by what we ingest, we probably have an impact on the gut health, but also on how mental health. So in the West of France, we have a scientific continuum, a scientific expertise to cover all this uh, 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 line from milk and, and bacteria to milk product, gut and brain. So uh, we gathered together six different academic labs uh, with complementary expertise in bioinformatics, which show, we cover uh, uh, some uh, bioinformatics on, on genomics of uh, dairy bacteria, let's say, or on the modeling the, the interaction between microbes and the, the so-called uh, intestinal epithelial barrier. Microbiology and meat processing, allergy, nutrition, cognition, and gut-brain gut axis. So all these labs are, uh, are located in Rennes or in Nantes in the west of France. So the population we target are the first 1,000 days of life of very young children and the seniors. And the functionalities we will address are colonization and homeostasis of the gut microbiota, cognitive development, neurodegeneration, or inflammation and allergy. So the central uh, focus is really the health effect of the fermented dairy products. And we will use three levers to, uh, to investigate this or to improve this. Bacteria, first of all, the bacteria, milk and milk components, and the process, either to prepare the milk components or to make sure that the health effect that we will have during fermentation of milk by bacteria will be kept during the process. For example, in highly processed, uh, processed uh, 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 um, uh, products like uh, infant formula, for example. So the structure of the projects is the following. We were first, uh, we, have, we have already started to concept and to characterize some bacterial consortia and then we test them in vitro and in vivo. We test their efficiency in terms of health effect. And we will implement this in a model or in different models, uh, dairy products uh, dedicated to target populations of so either the very young children or the seniors. And what is interesting is that we have developed three different platforms to help each of the steps so an in silico screening platform based on the genomes of bacteria to make sure that when we put together these bacteria, they will be able all together to produce uh, the vitamin or the GABA or whatever we want. An in vitro screening platform with enteroids. So these are cellular models which are mimic really uh, 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 genuinely uh, what happens in the, in, the, in, in the real organs. 
So th this will avoid also uh, the use of, uh, uh, as much as possible, the use of uh, uh, animal experiments and also the dairy technology platform to put this in, uh, in, in the model products. And the last, the ultimate stay step is the industrial implementation. So the, the industrials that are part of the project will use all these pre-competitive research results and put them in their own industries or own products. So some figures regarding this project. It's a five-year duration project. And in terms of human resources, we have five PhD projects four postdoc projects and five different technician or engineer uh, contracts. So the funding is almost uh, four, uh, 14 million euros for the full cost. It is funded, about half of it is funded by uh, BBA Milk Valley, which is a consortium of uh, milk transformers in the west of France. And about 200 million is funded by the Governor, the regional government of uh, Bretagne and Pays de Loire in the west of France. So I put you here the, the titles of the PhD projects. So one, three, and five PhD projects, number one, three, and five, uh, have already been launched a year ago. And uh, this, this month, number two and number three have been launched. So uh, this deals with the development of an infant formula, so milk powder for babies with a complex bacterial component based on the breast milk microbiota to evaluate its impact on intestinal homeostasis. Fermentation as a lever for improving infant formulas, design of fermented formula, improving brain development in newborns. A combined effect, we will also investigate the combined effects of propionic acid bacteria and N6, omega-6 that we heard of in the previous presentation, polyunsaturated fatty acids on the intestinal barrier, and the combination of microbes to boost brain functionality and the effect of these bacterial metabolites on the gut-brain axis during normal and pathological aging. And the last one is an in silico modeling of host lactic acid bacteria interactions at the epithelial intestinal barrier. So the four postdoc projects are the benefits of microbial components similar to breast milk in infant formula, prevention and food allergy, immunomodulation of the bacteria by the bacterial surface towards fermented dairy products as a remedy against allergy, optimizing the health effects of bacterial component of dairy products and ability of fermented dairy products to modulate the activation of gut brain access during access activation stress. So I want to thank you now for your presentation. As I told you, unfortunately, we do not have results to present you today, but uh, hopefully in, uh, in the coming month, the coming year, we will, uh, we will publish our first results. So these are all the, the companies that are part of Baby Mill Valley, and we have the support of Valoria, and of course, the two government, uh, regional government, of Brittany and Pays de Loire. And these are the names uh, of uh, all the academic lab involved in the project. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Hives, uh, for the, the presentation of the excellent project and the uh, very interest uh, for nowadays and about the what happens and when we can do for a, a better health, mental health. So we expect excellent results. Um, and <laughs> thank you. So the next speak, speaker is Ines Vendel, is a research and development scientist and CATAA, an agri-food technological center in Castel Branco. Um, uh, involved in various projects, including European project Horizon 2020. Ines also provides advice to local food companies regarding product or process optimization and issues related to food legislation. She will talk about the enriching one of the oldest staple foods in the world, bread fortification. Hello, thank you. Uh, so I will just uh, put the presentation now. So just a second. 
<laughs> Sorry. So, uh, hello, everybody. Um, so, I will present you, um, uh, well, uh, some, some novelties about bread fortification. So, basically, my presentation is about reaching one of the oldest staple foods in the world, uh, which is uh, bread, of course. And, um, well, uh, my colleagues al already spoke about uh, the definition of food fortification itself. So basically adding one or more essential nutrients to a food, whether or not it is normally contained in the food, uh, to increase the nutritional uh, value of food and, of course, to prevent or correct a certain deficiency in a specific uh, target population. And here, the, the, um, the basic strategy is basically to select the right vehicle, uh, which should be a food that is commonly eaten by the, by the target uh, population group, also economically affordable and available all year long. So this is basically the definition of staple uh, foods. Um, so here there are some well foods example foods that are already in the market uh, fortified with certain vitamins or minerals such as the milk with a and d vitamins so um for the, uh, adding uh, there is more to fortification than just adding nutrients to food as already mentioned before in the other presentations so we have to consider um, the bioavailability and consider, of course, the food matrix uh, effects uh, and also providing ad, uh, the, the enough amounts of absorbable nutrients, the sensory qualities such as taste, flavor, a texture that can be altered uh, with the fortification and, of course, the stability. So, first of all, the fortification must survive the food making process. And also, uh, afterwards, it can affect storage uh, of foods. And, of course, the cost uh, of production and the, 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 then the final cost in the market should be uh, considered for the fortification. So, uh, well, um, when talking about uh, bread, Let's not forget its main ingredient, which is flour. Uh, and that's why I will uh, focus on flour in the next slides. So, uh, so flour uh, is a uh, staple food uh, against uh, uh, hidden hunger and malnutrition uh, across the world. So, um, sorry, I'm having some <laughs> issues. Uh, uh, here, so um, across the world, you can see in the map here, color code uh, map, you can see uh, that the different countries have mandatory fortification in um, in uh, in flour and uh, in, in different types of flour. For example, sixty five countries around the world um, have mandatory wheat flour, uh, uh, fortified wheat flour. And for example, the US uh, is one of the countries that has um, several uh, flowers fortified like wheat and maize flour and also rice. So these are just uh, uh, some examples. And in the table below, you can see the countries, the type of flowers they... they Very English. Can it's you better, you know, because it's not past the, the presentation. It's better to, to remove the mode of presentation. Sorry? You, can, you cannot you can see, see anything. Is the, no. Oh. It's, it's frozen, the presentation. Where, where yeah. is it uh, at the moment? Uh, um, there is more. Uh, is the second slide or the Oh, the my third? God. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, remove the mode so of presentation. I will, no, because... <laughs> If I remove, then you cannot see the whole. <laughs> so I okay. will interrupt and do it again. Again, okay. sorry, I'm having I'm issues sorry. with the, P the with the computer, and I don't know what's what's going on. Sorry, I will interrupt okay. and then again. Okay. okay, sorry about this. So please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you see it uh, now? 
No. And now? Uh, yes, he's in the same slide, I think. In this same? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Jeez. Okay, but he's... Okay, he's, see. Yeah. So you see it now. There. Okay, yeah. so... So let's say, well, the flower again, <laughs> I have the picture here. Can you see it? Yes? Uh, Can you yes. see the ingredients? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, now. <laughs> oh. oh, my God. Uh, so I was showing you, well, I was thinking I was showing this map <laughs> of um, fortified, a mandatory fortification of different types of flower around the world. You can see it, right, Susanna? Yes. I'm sorry, okay. I'm, I'm a bit afraid <laughs> now. <laughs> so you have some examples here, as I told you before, in the US there's uh, more than just wheat flour, they also have maize flour and rice. And also in this table, you have some examples uh, here of the countries, the food vehicle, uh, the different types of flour mostly with flour and the nutrients they add in those um, uh, flowers. Um, so um, there's this flower fortification in initiative that was already mentioned before. Um, and um, I, I just, I will show you just two minutes of this uh, video, um, which is a, a good example of what's going on in certain countries, and this is the case in Egypt. So, uh, okay, just a second. Oh, sorry. So they have this flower fortification in Egypt uh, that started some years ago. Um, they have the baladi bread, which is a wheat um, flour bread. And one of the most important staple foods uh, for them. I'll just try to... Sorry, Ines, we don't have uh, sound. I don't know if we it's... don't have sound. Okay. Oh. Okay. So, so they they have the subtitles now. Thank you. 
So basically, sorry, I will carry uh, carry on. Um, so this was um, actually the the example in uh, well in Egypt and also the the action of this flower fortification initiative that is actually um, uh, uh, where several countries in the world participate. So uh, for next slide. Uh, so the latest news in 2021 this year. Oh, so, uh, Susanna, can you confirm if you think the next slide? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, because okay. The, the computer is really slow. <laughs> so you have some examples like, um, well, the sad news, the starving crisis in Madagascar. And uh, one of the, the, the things I saw on the news is actually they are giving fortified flour called plumpidos uh, to the children to, to actually help uh, surviving this crisis. Also, in the UK, um, they are finally, the, the, the government, they are discussing the, the UK's government decision to finally. Um, make 45 flour uh, mandatory uh, with folic acid to help prevent birth defects. And also you have the same case in New Zealand. This year the law came out and um, they will, uh, so all non-organic wheat flour used for making bread must be fortified with B vitamin folic acid by mid 2023. Finally, there was a report that uh, sh uh, this year also that um, it expects to see a, a, a massive growth of fortified flower market by 2026. And this involves the largest companies in, in the world. Uh, so these are the latest news of this uh, year about flower fortification. And also, if we check the PubMed, where you can, you, the, the engine, where you can see the biomedical literature, if you see all the years uh, so far, only the, the last 10 years, we have much more publications uh, regarding fortified bread than ever before. So this shows uh, clearly the, the, the high interest and the increasing interest in this, um, well, in bread fortification and the impact on health. So um, now I will show you some cases uh, in, in the literature of fortified breads uh, and some research that was made. For example, in number one, um, so vitamin B12 was added as a fortificant and they, they show that it's, it actually can survive the, the bread making process. And in the end, uh, they, 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 they tested some people that consumed this, this bread and they observed that um, uh, this vitamin B12 uh, was 50% bioavailable, which is the same as consuming uh, other natural endogenous food sources of B12 uh, vitamin like meat uh, or fish. So these were very promising results. Also in the second article, you can see another example. They added the grape pomace powder, a wine making process by product to bread. Well, although it gave, um, of course, a different uh, taste, it did not affect bread acceptability. And also it increased dietary fiber, polyphenols and the antioxidant capacity of, of that bread. Uh, so, two more examples. Um, uh, the fortified bread with vitamin D was shown to be effective in raising serum vitamin D in the volunteers in, in the study, in this uh, clinical trial. And also, uh, curiously, it showed uh, the, the improvement of metabolic markers in the, the subjects in the study. Uh, finally, uh, the last example I show here is the fortification with whole cereals and seeds um, in bread, of course, and it increased dietary fiber, phenolic compound content, and improved the antioxidant capacity of bread. 
So they are, these are just uh, some examples of fortified breads and uh, well, the, the so uh, uh, now, trending now, um, in Europe, bread brands are increasing fiber. Uh, vitamin D is also receiving attention, especially last year. Uh, so regarding fiber, the population is becoming more aware about the importance of uh, consuming fiber. And uh, this may, may, of course, reflect the, the publicity around the importance of gut microbiota and gut health. Um, and of course, the, the effects on immunity. Um, and also people are more aware that modern diets uh, lack fiber. So they, they, um, they, are, they are acknowledging the importance of consuming more fiber. So vitamin D was the, the most such vitamin in the last months and uh, triggered by its ability to enhance immunity levels. And these are some uh, facts, curiosity checks. 31% uh, of UK bread buyers uh, identify high fiber as an appealing purchase drivers. So one of the most appealing purchase drivers. Uh, in France, um, well, female consumers prefer La Baguette au Céréal. Um, and there's this news uh, from last year during the pandemics that some scientists um, uh, urged to, to add vitamin D to bread and milk to help fight COVID. Probably this was before the, the vaccines. Um, I don't know. And... Uh, some examples in the markets, uh, either in Portugal, Spain, France, and the UK, you have some bread with cereals, with seeds, uh, also with vitamin D and calcium, and also, also you have the baguettes with cereals uh, in France. So thanks, all of you, and um, well, and sorry for the issues <laughs> during the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ines, um, for showing the, the results of positive results in health with the bread fortification with vitamin D and um, calcium. So the next speaker is Paulo Municata. He's a researcher at the MIT Technology Center of Galicia. Uh, he is researching strategies to develop healthier meat products, emphasizing reducing sodium content, improving fat composition, and adding natural extracts to replace food additives. I will speak about the strategies to obtain healthy meat products. So, um, thank you for the kind introduction, Susanna. <clears throat> I'll share my screen in a second. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to join you today in this event. So I'll talk today about some strategies to obtain health image products. So I would like to start with a brief introduction about why we, have, why we produce health image products. Well, essentially, uh, image products are important daily source of nutrients, proteins, vitamins, and fat, and minerals. But at the same time, image products are also important source of uh, components that has been associated at some extent to increase the risk of disease. And they are um, sodium chloride, saturated fat, cholesterol, and some additives. Um, like was commenting, we, we need to, <clears throat> to rethink and improve the technological process of meat products. And we need to, to work with an, a new concept that's known as reformulation. And this reformulation aims to change the composition of meat products and also have a great attention to changes in quality, safety, and also the shelf life of meat products. And we have these uh, main research lines that aim to reduce the fat content, uh, modify the fatty acid profile, and reduce cholesterol and sodium chloride content, and also um, replace some additives with active or bioactive ingredients, especially from natural sources. In the face of this uh, the situation, uh, the Health Meat Network was created. This uh, network 
is funded by CPED, that's an organization that aims to promote the scientific and technological development in the uh, Ibero-American countries. And uh, the network uh, is centered in the, in the, in the nutrition improvements of meat products, essentially, in order to reduce the risk associated to the cardiovascular disease and other disease, and also uh, ensure no increase in caloric value of the reformulated products. We also aim to support and foster the research and develop uh, products, generating information, data, and discussion around them, and also reaffirm and enhance uh, enhance all the um, all the efforts made by the companies in the sector that are voluntarily and consensually making um, changes in their products in order to provide a shopping basket that is. Uh, that can compose a more balanced diet for consumers. And also, at uh, the long term, we also uh, would want to uh, help consumers to make good, uh, good practices while uh, buying food and eating food in order to have a, a whole improvement in their diets. The network is composed by um, <clears throat> 20 research groups with more than 100 researchers. They are located in Spain, Portugal, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Ecuador, Colombia, and Mexico. In our network, we explore four main strategies to develop health from each products. The first one consists in the reduction uh, uh, of uh, sodium chloride. In our case, we are studying different mix of salts uh, aiming to, to meet sodium chloride with calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, and also with uh, calcium chloride. We also aim to reduce and substitute uh, animal fat by others that are more suitable for the human needs, especially those rich in omega-3 fatty acids. <clears throat> we also explore uh, natural extracts that are rich on active compounds that are relevant for technological and health reasons. And, and also and probiotics and meat products. So now I will talk uh, briefly about some studies that we carry out here in CTC, where we explore each one of these strategies. The first one is about the sodium chloride replacement by other chloride salts in the processing of dry curd for cecina. Here, uh, we prepare three treatments. The first one is with 100% uh, sodium chloride. Then we uh, prepare another batch with a 50% reduction in sodium chloride using a binary mix with, with uh, potassium chloride and then a third mix of salts, a quaternary mix, aiming for a 55% reduction in sodium chloride. We, we with this uh, salt mixture, we obtain an important reduction, especially in sodium chloride content in the final product. And also, <clears throat> preserve the, the texture properties of, uh, of cecina. This is a very important outcome because you know, during the process of cecina, the, the proteolysis is a very important uh, phenomenon and the, the absence of sodium chloride leads to excessive degradation of the structural proteins and eventually leads to, uh, to track, uh, texture defects. And in our case, using this mixture of salts, we obtain a uh, preservation of this, this uh, texture of properties. And in conclusion, we'll, it was possible to obtain a low sodium cecina with a 50% reduction in sodium content using the quaternary mix of salts. And this, uh, the second strategy is the replacement of uh, animal fat. We all know that animal fat is an important um, component in meat products that increase fat content, saturated fatty acids, and also cholesterol. The straightforward solution is the use of uh, another, another oils that are aimed to improve the content of unsaturated fatty acids and reduce cholesterol, the cholesterol content. But the problem is this direct substitution does not lead to a product that has the same, the same properties than the original ones that we are used to. So uh, our strategy here is use a gelin agent that is intended to mix, mimic the, the animal fat and produce a structured oil system where we can change the, the fatty acid composition. With this in mind, um, 
we we tested the system in beef burgers uh, by incorporating algae and which germ oils emulsions emulsions we prepared for treatments uh, control with pork back fat uh, treatment uh, two treatments test individually each one of these oils and a fourth treatment combined amounts of each one of this this oils um, regarding the fatty acid composition, it's our main analysis for this study. We obtained a reduction in the saturated uh, fatty acid content, also a reduction in monosaturated fatty acids, but an important increase in pollen stature of fatty acids that are associated with a better health status. Particularly for this product, an uh, important increase in omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids uh, were obtained. And this, all this modification led to a product with a healthier lipid profile. We also uh, evaluated the sensory properties of this, this beef burger because when you change the, the fat composition, it may lead to a, a product with a different uh, sensory profile. In our case, we obtained a similar scores uh, for all the this, uh, sensory parameters between the control and the algae oil treatment. And we also uh, obtained a similar <clears throat> uh, acceptance and the similar intention to buy between these two treatments. While we, we have an impartial reduction when we use the witch germ oil in the system. In conclusion, it was possible to produce a low fat burger using this structured system using this, uh, the 10% uh, algae oil emulsion and also any important modifications that were associated to the reduction of saturated fatty acids, the N6, N3 uh, radio, and also improving the content of polyunsaturated fatty acids and preserve the sensory attributes of the product. The third strategy is the use of natural antioxidants. We know that uh, natural antioxidants are found especially in, in the in, in, in vegetables. Uh, and in, in our case, we center <clears throat> the application of uh, polyphenols that are natural antioxidants that has been associated at some level with an increased health status. And uh, the use of these natural antioxidants generate uh, a first challenge that is, that is the extraction of this compound. There's a lot of options. In our case, we, we tested the supercritical CO2 extraction method that has important advantages that support their use uh, in meat products and foods in general, because uh, the, the extract, once it's obtained, it's solvent free, the CO2 evaporates, it's only the, the extract. If you want to explore the, the composition of the, of the extract, this technology is compatible with food grade solvents and also is of easy recover. And it's not necessary any further uh, concentration or separation steps to use this, this extracting each product. We tested uh, specifically the turmeric extract in fresh lamb sausages using this technology, superficial CO2, and also combining with the use uh, of uh, the procelia, which was the, 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 uh, the structure oil emulsion using targeted oil, which is um, an important source uh, of polyunsaturated fatty acids. In this case, we prepare five treatments, a control without antioxidant, a treatment with the commercial antioxidant, and also three treatments with increasing concentrations of our extract. We observed um, <clears throat> uh, an increase in the antioxidant status of product in the, in the fresh product and also through off the storage period of 18 days at four, uh, cell, four, four uh, degrees Celsius. This increase in antioxidant status was reflected in uh, increased lipid oxidative stability of the product when we observe here in the in this figure. And we, and we also uh, prevented the accumulation of volatile compounds that are derived from the lipid oxidation process in uh, especially hexanol, ethanol, octanol, that are aldehydes that are associated with the perception of rancidity in the product. 
In the, <clears throat> we also uh, perform a, a sensory analysis in fresh and cooked samples. In fresh samples, uh, we observe that, that after 12 days of refrigerated storage, the treatments with 250 and 750 ppm of extract were considered acceptable in terms of odor, while the control and the treatment with the commercial antioxidant uh, had, uh, were considered unacceptable. In terms of uh, cooked samples, we observed a slight reduction in the acceptance of color because the extract was uh, kind of yellowish, and this led to a reduction, but all samples were considered acceptable. acceptable. Uh, at the same time, uh, the addition of, of of this natural extract increase the, the scores for other. So the, the acceptance of the samples containing the natural extract were more acceptable by consumers. In conclusion, it was possible to produce a healthy fresh lamb sausage using the turmeric extract in this range of concentrations and also replace the commercial antioxidant. Um, this is the last strategy that I would like to comment to you with you today. It's the use of uh, prebiotics and probiotics in each products. We tested the use of fruit oligosaccharides and two probiotic strains. We prepared four formulations. The first one, a control without any of these uh, functional ingredients. A second one, using only the dietary fiber and two treatments and uh, combining the dietary fiber with the Paracas A DGP-1 strain or the Ruminosos GG strain. We observed in terms of texture, that was a significant increase in, in, in all the variables evaluated in terms of hardness, springness, cohesiveness, team, uh, gumness, and chillness due to the combination of the two function uh, components in relation to the control the treatment containing only the dietary fiber. In terms of um, microbiology analysis, the treatment that stand out among all the others was the combination of the dietary fiber with the ruminosal GG strain, because it has had the, the highest count of lactic acid bacteria, and also uh, the most uh, significant reductions of yeast and enterobacteria counts at the end of a repellent period. In terms of, um, give me a second. Uh, in terms of uh, sensory uh, in terms of lipid uh, lipid oxidative stability, we do not observe any significant effects. And also, in terms of uh, sensory analysis, uh, no effects were obtained. In conclusion, it was possible to obtain a, a low-fat sausage and combine probiotics and prebiotics in the formulation. And the recommended formulations. The combination with the, the fruitolicosaccharides with the Raminosos GG strain. Um, thank you very much for your kind of attention. I'm really sorry about the technical issues that I had in the beginning of the presentation. It's a lot of, uh, to discuss about the health from each product. And if you are interested, please, please get in touch with us. And again, thank you very much for the opportunity to join me today. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, we did a presentation that demonstrates the, the, how can meat uh, can how can uh, obtain healthy meat products with uh, low sodium and fat, and use the extracts to, to improve the, the nutritional quality of the of the meat. Um, so we open now the, the time for questions. Uh, I remember I we uh, you can uh, use the Q and A to 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 make the, the the questions. So I we have one questions for I think Charlotte. That's uh, from Valentin. Uh, what do you think in general of fortification in vegan products? Do you find it necessary? Um. Yes, so uh, I mentioned during my presentation that um, there are some very common deficiencies in some population consuming plant-based diet. So it's typically the case for people uh, having very strict vegan uh, diets. So for, the, for those people, uh, fortification or consumption of supplements is uh, advised, uh, especially in vitamin uh, B12, calcium and iron. Uh, it's not the same for uh, vegetarian people. Uh, if they are 
uh, careful about what they eat, they can consume sufficient uh, a sufficient level of nutrients. So the the focus is really on on vegan people. Thank you. We have also uh, one question. I don't think it's Charlotte, but I think it's um, uh, Narcisa. Uh, Luminaria is a macro on on or a macro hulk. Is a seaweed. Uh, as you used to say, is a maxi one, not a mini one, <laughs> because sometimes the words are very similar with micro and micro. Are the uh, digitata um, is uh, laminaria digitata is a seaweed, a macro <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if 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 has more questions. Um, no. Okay. Um, I have one question for Ines. Ines. Um, you talk about the select the right vehicle uh, based on target group. You can uh, say um, uh, if it's different uh, in terms of target group from Portugal, Spain. So the, the, the babies in Portugal is, I think that is infant food fortification. And, but in the whole Audrey um, group uh, is difference uh, between um, 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 countries. Sorry. Uh, um, I don't know if I understood correctly the, the, the question. So you, you, the, the, the target groups, you mean? Um, Is this different uh, between the countries? Um, well, you have the, the, the pregnant, for, for instance, that I think it's um, worldwide. So in terms of uh, folic acid, for instance, to avoid the... the but I'm not responding your question. So, uh, but I think the, the, for the flower, it's uh, a quiet, universal uh, and uh, widespread. Uh, sorry, I have a toddler here with me and is making noise okay so <laughs> sorry for that um, but i think the flower can uh, flower and rice so these staple foods can actually um reach almost everyone in the almost the entire world i mean you have different types of flower you can play with it in one country the wheat flower can be used uh, in another country the maize flower can be used in asia you have the rice so you can actually uh, reach the, the, the whole population and depending on the, and of course, within this population, which is very heterogeneous, you can um, play with the, um, with the things, the substances that you will uh, add to the, that flower. So you can target the elder, the, the people, the older people, you can target the, the pregnant, you can target the children. So it depends. So I don't know if I <laughs> responded to your question, but I think it's, it's a good way. This, this staple food, it's actually one of the oldest in the world. So the, the bread, so the bread. I think it's a good vehicle to reach everyone and all the target populations and you just have to play with the substances that you you put and and those sorry <laughs> okay thank you we have one more two questions um for narcisa uh, so one of the participants missed a point about selenium in fish nutrition um could you explain it again Well, this, this um, uh, was a work developed in uh, trying to, to increase selenium. And what was done was the production of uh, um, a vegetable rich in selenium that was incorporated in the, in the feed, uh, more connected with, um, how to say, <laughs> Uh, now I'm, uh, but uh, well, is a vegetable that um, in Portuguese is alho, alho, 
what uh, you say in English? <laughs> garlic. Garlic, yes, garlic was missed at the moment the name. But uh, in fact, what was happening is, uh, as we know, uh, selenium is, is, is a very important component. And at the same time, uh, was placed uh, in, in the feed. Uh, this was, um, well, some studies in the enrichment related with the production of the vegetable was a European project with a long, uh, long way. But uh, the idea was trying to increase the levels of uh, uh, selenium and uh, this incorporation in feed. And uh, I don't know if the, the papers that we present there uh, were clear, but there is the, all the, the story and was done with uh, a group. I was very involved in this part and trying to, to increase the, because one problem was the sensory aspects also with garlic and so on, and if the fish gets all the, the this, uh, but at the end, uh, the product was very well evaluated and uh, of course the, the prices will increase. I have seen that some questions were related with that. But uh, when we think about the uh, health of population and uh, trying to 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 get uh, to decrease the 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 related with the, what is expanded in the in the in the treatments, I think that is uh, something that needs to be evaluated and trying to to go because. Uh, uh, is better all the time trying to prevent than to treat. And uh, probably if we are uh, preparing uh, foods that can help in the prevention, this uh, will uh, save uh, some money in the, in the treatments in the future. And this is something to, to take into account. Thank you. I don't know if uh, the question was answered, but... Uh, yes. And okay. the next already answered, yes. Uh, so we have another uh, for Narcisa, <laughs> sorry. In the fish fortification case, have the effect of grow parameters been followed in the study? Uh, uh, well, yes, we, we take into account the, the, the growth parameters and the growth parameters were, were okay because uh, even in the, in the case of uh, no significant difference, I, I remember about this salt that uh, case study that I show were uh, very uh, relevant. The, the main aspects were related uh, with the balance between uh, omega-6 and omega-3 and so on, and this needs to be evaluated. But, uh, Thank you for the question. Not, uh, I think that, uh, in fact, uh, with time and uh, preparing all with uh, uh, what we believe is that fish is getting more and more vegan also with adaptations, of course, but needs to be carefully evaluated because if you do not evaluate it carefully, at the end you can have a fish with a very unbalanced uh, related with omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. And this is something to take into account because when we eat fish, we are searching for EPA in the HA. EPA for the prevention of cardiovascular disease and so on. And the HA also very related with the neurodegenerative protection ag against uh, uh, Alzheimer and other diseases. And of course, if you take the, the best things and you, as we know, we have metabolic cascades and all the time omega-3 are competing with omega-3. And you, if you have a very high balance of omega-6, of course, at the end, we do not have the same result as the omega-3 level is very more high and less omega-6 and uh, having this into account uh, in terms of prevention of the diseases is very important to, to, to have this balance in mind and of course, and thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, I think that this is in, for all speakers. Uh, of all the fortifications presented, fish, flour, dairy and meat, are there any products already in the market?
if Narcisa can answer for fish and Dinesh Brandon for a flower. A related, sorry, for the 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 the, uh, the question is about the is any product already in the market? These fortification products. This, uh, well, we are uh, very focused in the, at the moment in the in uh, but we know that uh, at market at moment are uh, fish that uh, are uh, like superfood fish that uh, is uh, at moment in productions even in in, in Portugal we know that uh, uh, with the use of uh, my um, seaweeds in fish production and with that you can have a premium product that can go to another uh, way uh, to 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 go and uh, of course in in terms of uh, these productions and the increase uh, and the balance of uh, omega 3 related with the uh, omega 3 uh, omega 6 um, we know that uh, in the market we have a very good uh, um, uh, offers at the moment thank you thank you um, yes. uh, so you asked me also the question. So basically, in the European market now there's a lot of fiber uh, uh, bread uh, supplemented with with the fiber, um, either by adding uh, seeds or or uh, cereals, and also in the Asian. I'm sorry, I have a sick toddler. <laughs> so, okay, I will. Uh, <laughs> I will pass. Sorry. <laughs> In the Asian yeah. market, you have, uh, they are adding vegetable. Sorry, I have to interrupt. <laughs> okay. Don't worry. Uh, regarding the, the dairy products, uh, I can say that for infant formula, so meal powder for babies, there are already existing products that include um, uh, oligosaccharides, for example, or one or two strains of probiotic bacteria. So uh, you can include this into the infant formula, but the problem is that for probiotic uh, bacteria, for example, you cannot claim that uh, you cannot put on the sticker, on the box, that this is good for health, for the development of something like that. So uh, uh, from the regulation point of view, it's very restricted, in fact. But there are already some, some products with uh, oligosaccharide and probiotics in, uh, in the infant formula. Thank you, Hypes. So I think that is no more questions. Um, so um, I hope everybody found that helpful and uh, we will have one more webinar um, in the half. And so you can go to Hepf's website and see the service and uh, the next webinars and uh, thank you for for all the, the speakers to the excellent presentations thank you